red and green, red and green, alternating. But dips were all bought. Welcome to Market Street, the show where we will tell you all that happened in those six hectic hours of trading in just five simple headlines. I'm Lata Venkatesh. With me, my colleague, Prashant Nair. Hi, Prashant. Lata, the anthem for the market is by the dip, isn't it? I mean, yes. uh, 100 points lower at one point, and we ended with a three and a half odd point <laughs> cut. Uh, you know, we'll tell you all about it. As always, it's a packed show in market opinion. We will get you Vetri Subramaniam of UTI Asset Management Company weighing in on market direction from here. Sandeep Bhatia of Macquarie Group will also be uh, the market voice today. In corporate opinion, uh, Vijay Nakra of m and and Vinod Agarwal of Aisha Motors give us their company's growth outlooks. Finally, banking veterans KV Kamath and uh, D. Subarao tell us what they make of the uh, proposal as far as corporate ownership of Indian banks go. But before we get to all of that opinion, as always, let's wrap up the day in terms of stock market action itself. Lata. A little difficult to wrap up the day because it looked largely like profit-taking after a day of heavy gains. Last 24 hours uh, before the sun rose on Asia today, we saw such, you know, a huge amount of gains made by the bulls in all markets, Wall Street, Asia, Europe, India, that today it looked like they wanted to just digest the gains. And that's what we saw. Dips were bought, uh, as we said in our headlines, because there was this good news of the Pfizer and the BioNTech uh, vaccine getting UK approval. And generally a feeling that, uh, you know, normal life or economic recovery is around the corner because uh, maybe half the population of the world will be uh, vaccinated by 2021 or end of 2021. The uh, gains in the Indian market, well, uh, banks were quite clearly the losers, uh, the big private banks, but uh, there were several pockets of gains, especially the economy-facing mid-caps. Mid-caps generally did a little better, but uh, the economy-facing ones, you know, like hotel, those that benefit when the market opens, they were the ones that were the flag bearers for the bulls. And uh, to be fair, actually, even in the big caps, it was only the uh, banks that got pummeled. Others, a bunch of them, IT, Pharma, all of them, we're doing reasonably well. But you give us more colour, uh, Prashant, uh, losers and laggards, if any. Uh, <laughs> well, they were, uh, Lata. So let me just actually, they were more gainers than losers. Market breadth was positive, uh, even when the Nifty was down 100 points. So it, no point in advanced decline turn sharply negative. So this is basically where uh, the bulk of the gains were uh, concentrated in. Uh, real estate continues its march higher. Uh, the entire metal spec uh, off the highs. At one point, the index was up 3.5%. It ended 25 higher. Public sector companies, not just banks, but generally, I mean, so the CPSC index was up. Uh, energy, again, a lot of uh, PSU names there. Consumer and autos were other areas where we saw gains. Uh, you know, banks were largely down. So private bank index, PSU bank index, and the Nifty bank itself, about 1.19% lower. But that too came off the lows. The Nifty Bank was down almost 600 points at the day's low. It was down 350 by close. Uh, large caps uh, in terms of gains coming through in, as I said, uh, uh, government companies, Gale, ONGC, Coal India, Indian Oil Corporation. Uh, then there was SBI Life. Uh, and then, of course, names like Asian Paints, Titan, Adani Ports, Tata Steel and JSW Steel uh, gained. The steel names came off the day's high. Adani Ports, of course, the entire Adani group, uh, uh, be it Adani Green or Ports, Power, uh, they've had a fantastic run and they're all at uh, pretty much highs. What was down? Uh, Kotak Bank, HDFC Bank, uh, HDFC Limited, ICICI Bank and Bajaj Finance. So as I said, uh, the main pressure on the indices came from these large banking names. Now we come to the broader market and uh, the gains there. As I said, Adani Group stocks flying high, Adani Enterprises, top of the list, large volumes. Tata Chemicals uh, has done well now for the last, what, uh, fortnight or so. Phoenix Mills, there was that uh, proposed deal, 12% uh, higher, 768. Uh, there was uh, Subex, Indian Hotels, Jubilant Industries, Century Textiles, IIFL, uh, Manganese Ore, Moil, AIA Engineering, after a long time it saw a bit of a pop, and uh, VA Tech Webag was the other one which uh, did uh, quite well. So that's basically uh, what was up. I could run you through, uh, through some losers as well, Lata, but, you know, uh, what, what went up went up on very strong volumes. What was down uh, was down little and lacked volume. So I'm just going to leave it with this list of gainers. Back to you. Oh, yes, we are more than happy. We are always happy with the colour green, aren't we?
but uh, Prashant, uh, some interesting market opinion. Uh, we got opinion from Vetri Subramanian, the fund manager at UTI AMC. Now, I would think that more than his stock, you should look at his walk in the sense UTI Mutual Fund is going to launch a small cap fund. And Vetri told us why. As well, uh, we spoke with Sanjeev Bhatia, uh, Sandeep Bhatia, sorry, of Macquarie. And he also is kind of uh, saying that you should bet more on mid caps going forward because of the uh, economic recovery. Listen to both these experts. Small cap space is a very interesting space. Uh, obviously, it's an area which requires a lot more sort of effort in terms of the research, in terms of digging deep, because this is an area of the market where actually institutional ownership is much lower. Uh, research coverage from the sell side is a lot more limited. And in a sense, therefore, it also plays to our strengths because as an organization, we have a very strong investment process, a strong investment team, and the experience of having dealt when invested in these small and uh, younger companies. I think the uh, large indices, large caps have done their run. Uh, so if the market performance has to broad base itself, then mid caps is, is definitely something where we can see traction. Uh, we are in the middle of our Bakwari annual conference, and clearly there's a lot of discussion about the state of the economy. Uh, we are seeing a good rebound right now, uh, but the real, real test of the economy is the first quarter and next year. And clearly th those, uh, these kind of uh, issues, if, if the economy does revive, mid-caps will be where the performance lies. Okay, that is uh, Vetri Subramaniam and Sandeep Bhatia with uh, views on markets, mid-cap and bro uh, the broader market and sharp focus there. Uh, as we told you, the market uh, saw a sharp uh, recovery from the day's low. Uh, this after the uh, after headlines broke that uh, United Kingdom has become the first Western country to approve the Pfizer-BioNTech coronavirus vaccine for use. It will be rolled out next week in that country and elderly people in care homes and medical workers will be the first ones to get it. The UK government has accepted the regulator's recommendations to approve the vaccine. UK Health Secretary has said that the National Health Service, the NHS, is ready and will start vaccinating people next week. BioNTech has agreed to supply 40 million vaccine doses to UK uh, this year and uh, the bulk of it, of course, coming through in 2021 as well. Pfizer's chairman and CEO Albert Bolra said the authorization was a historic moment point. Uh, that's some, definitely a historic moment. To the second headline now, Bharti Airtel ended over 1% higher after we learned from sources that the company has increased its stake in its tower arm Bharti Infotel through creeping acquisition. This is a CNBC T8 exclusive brought to us by Nisha Pudar and she's joining us with all the details. Nisha. Thanks for that. Yes, it's a large transaction that has hit the bosses uh, this morning and it is worth uh, about 3,250-odd crore rupees worth of shares being traded on Bharti Infratel. I've spoken to five independent sources with direct knowledge on this development and they have shared with CNBC TV18 confirming that the parent company of Bharti Infratel, the TAR company, the parent company telecom major Bharti Airtel is the one which has picked up a 4.9% stake in the a tower arm party in Fratel. Now remember that as per the creeping acquisition norms, the parent promoter cannot buy more than 5% in one financial year. So they have stopped short of that. It has been done in various tranches at 216 rupees and two, uh, 224 rupees per share. And the stock has also inched up closer to the higher point. Now, uh, overall, uh, what I do gather is that the sellers are three buckets. Providence as well as Edgepoint are some of the big global investors who had a small minority stake in Bharti Infratel. They were looking for an exit. They could have actually exited through this particular trade by selling the shares to the promoter company, to the parent company. So those two are the assured uh, sellers as well as a clutch of institutional investors, especially foreign investors. So all put together, 14.7 crore shares have been sold in Bharti Infratel. I want to dispel one particular speculation uh, in the market of Vodafone UK's India entities, which own some stake in Bharti Infratel, that they have exited, but that is not true. Vodafone as well as KKR still remain in Bharti Infratel. 
And one important point to note is that with this kind of a stance taken by the promoter, it not only instills confidence in the company Bharti Infratel, but also hints at a possible strategic intent going forward. Uh, Nisha, thanks very much uh, for that. Well, let's move on to the third headline. Steel stocks were the toast of the day. JSW Steel, Tata Steel and JSPL surged anything between 2 and 4% due to a shortage of steel and hike in prices. I mean, we've seen price hikes now for the last three or four months. Even NMDC gained 4% after uh, NMDC increased its prices. Before. My colleague Nigel is here with all the details. Nigel. Well, that's right. NMDC was a stock to watch. That's on the back of three reasons. One being that the November sales numbers grew by close to 18%, so that was a positive. In addition to that, we here at CNBC TV18 told you first that, in fact, they're going to be going ahead and hiking prices by around 500 rupees per ton. Later in the day, the management, in fact, did confirm that on the stock exchanges, that, yes, they have hiked prices by 500 rupees per ton, takes accumulated price hikes in the last two months to around 1,000 rupees odd. And finally, sources indicate to us here at CNBC TV18 that, yes, they're on their way to going ahead and uh, starting uh, restarting mining at the Donamalai mines. That'll be good news because it'll add nearly around 7 million tons on an annual basis to their total sales, though they'll have to pay around 22.5% as premium. So those factors explain why NMDC was higher. But ferris stocks, they've had a good run as well, and all the steel stocks were higher in today's trading session. That's because we understand that price hikes have been affected to the tune of around 1,000 to around 1,500 rupees from December onwards. That means that the total price increases in the quarter three in comparison to quarter two is more than 5,000 rupees per ton. So that's good news for them. In addition to that, you know, you have Australia and China. Well, there's a, a, a bit of a ban that's uh, being imposed in terms of importing coking coal from Australia into China. And because of that, coking coal prices have corrected by close to 20%. That's one of the inputs. So it'll be good news for, uh, you know, the steel majors. And also the backward integrated ones in terms of iron ore, that is Tata Steel, JSPL, as well as Sale, they'll gain because they're getting iron ore from either their own backyard or, in fact, they've already fully paid, as is the case with JSPL. So that was the reason why all these ferris, ferris stocks were on fire. Oh, yes, sir. Steel shone like gold, didn't it? Thank you very much, uh, Nigel. We have to take a quick break on that note. But do stay tuned in. It was an extremely interesting day in the markets and we have lots of interesting stories left to tell you. Back, you're with us here on Markets Today. Big uh, buying from the day's lowest point and the market ending absolutely flat. We're running you through what happened during the day, the top stories and the opinion. Here's the fourth headline then. Auto companies like Aisha Motors and Hero Motor Corp reported November sales numbers which were below street expectations. Aisha said that demand for buses was still under pressure. m, &M said that auto demand has picked up. My colleague Sonia has all the details. Sonia. Well, thanks a lot for that. The big mover really this afternoon is Tata Motors on the back of very strong numbers coming through. Uh, the domestic sales have been good, especially because of the passenger vehicle sales that have doubled this time around. So total sales up by about 20%, domestic sales up by 26% and passenger vehicle sales have doubled. Although the commercial vehicle segment is still under pressure, that one is down almost 8.5%. In the two-wheeler space, though, you have a Hero Motor Corp and Aisha Motors that reported numbers that were below street expectations. It was still a growth, but lower than what the street was anticipating. So for Hero Motor Corp, the November sales came in at 5.91 lakh units. The expectation was 6.13, but it's still a 14% growth, and the management commentary is very strong. They say that they did 14 lakh retail sales in the 32-day festive period. And because of a pickup in personal mobility, the demand trends will continue to be very healthy in the two-wheeler space. Now on to Aisha Motors. Over there, the Royal Enfield growth has slowed down in November. The sales were below expectations at 63,782 units. It was a growth of just about 6 odd percent. And models with engine capacity of up to 350cc have seen only a 2% growth this time. However, we spoke to the management uh, who heads the Volvo Aisha commercial vehicle division and he said that month after month there is a recovery that they are seeing. The worst seems to be over and there is a lot of demand coming through in the construction, e-commerce and the logistics segment along with fuel tankers which have suddenly seen a pickup after many months of a slowdown. So all in all a mixed bag but the big takeaway really is that uh, commercial vehicle players are seeing a bit of a recovery as well as Tata Motors. That's been a huge positive move. The stock is up 60% from the lows that it saw in the month of September. Back to you. Yes, that it is. That it is, Sonia. Take your point entirely on Tata Motors. But uh, just to scratch the point that uh, Sonia just made, uh, we did speak with the management of m, &M and Aisha Motors. 
And they, among other things, after talking about a fairly decent recovery in several uh, verticals, did complain about a surge in steel prices on account of lower availability and, of course, uh, even a, a, an announced hike in prices. Here's what uh, the two managements had to say, Aisha and Eminem. Also, commodity availability. Suddenly, steel as a commodity um, uh, availability is a challenge. And uh, the latest that I've heard is now ECUs, for example, a very critical component that goes into the injection system, uh, which is required for automobiles. Uh, there is a huge demand for ECUs in the mobile industry. So that's another challenge that comes up. So there are some supply constraints uh, which are largely coming from the steel. Uh, today the steel is not only the inflation has gone up by 10 to 15 percent in last few months. Yes. Apart from that, uh, there is a constraint in supply of some of the uh, imported parts, especially the electronic items uh, like, for example, sensors or uh, connectors or um, electric con electronic control units. So there is huge constraint in supply of the electronic parts. Okay, let's move on to the fifth headline then. Mid-caps outperformed in trade, led by stocks, which are a play on the economic recovery theme. Names like Indian hotels uh, jumped more than 7%. Lemon Tree was up over 4%. Phoenix Mill surged almost 12%, but there was company-specific news flow there as well. It signed a non-binding term sheet with Singapore-based sovereign wealth fund GIC. My colleague Nipur has more on this. Nipur. Well, absolutely. The stock was buzzing on the back of the news that company and its subsidiaries have jointly signed non-binding term sheet with GIC Private Limited. And this deal is for formation and development of a strategic retail-led mixed-use platform. GIC will invest in company and its subsidiaries via a mix of primary infusion as well as purchase of equity shares. GIC will initially acquire an equity stake of 26% and further stake up to 35% on mutual agreement within a period of 12 months time. The assets are valued at an approximately enterprise value of 5600 crores, 5700 crores, indicating a cap rate of 6.5%. And these proceeds will be utilized for further growth expansion and new acquisitions. Uh, opinion coming in from various brokerage houses, CLSA says GIC deal is accredited at a cap rate of 6.5%. Deal proceeds will create watches for new acquisition. Uh, they are positive on the value potential of this deal with GIC and they maintain their buy rating and raised the target price to 872 from 790 per share. Antic also believes that this deal would be a big positive with improvement in their cash flows. Back to you. Okay, that's a big one. Thank you very much, uh, Nupur, for putting all that into perspective. Well, uh, before we sign off, here is another important addition to our coverage of the ongoing debate over uh, whether corporate houses should be allowed to own banks. Remember, this was recommended by an internal working group of the Reserve Bank. We've brought you uh, former governors and uh, uh, deputy governors of the Reserve Bank and other economists. Now, today we spoke with K.V. Kamat, the veteran banker, and former Reserve Bank governor D. Subarao. K.V. Kamat welcomes the proposal with K.V. ads, but Subarao thinks it's not the right time. Listen in. Unless we are able uh, to get the size of the banking system significantly larger than what it is today, I think uh, we will fall short in our ability to fund uh, you know, this growth. Of course, this growth may have depend on uh, other fund flows also, which at this point in time we won't talk about it. But you need a very strong domestic banking system and a very strong domestic market, a capital market, to provide for this growth. So you need to get the size of the banks up. This is not exactly an appropriate time to open up banking for corporates. For, for the very same reason, public confidence that supervisors will be able to protect them is also low. No supervisor, no matter how intelligent, how competent, no matter how intrusive the supervision is, will be able to check connected lending, prevent a corporate insider from misusing the bank for his own private business. Okay, that is some uh, really top-notch opinion coming in on the ongoing debate whether corporate ownership of banking should be allowed. Well, it's a wrap on this edition of Markets Today. Uh, from Lathami, everyone on the team, thank you very much for watching. More follows in just a bit.